nice broad question to make things as complicated as possible, but it's always fun to see how people interpret them. Um, my question to you really is, why do you photograph people? Um, because uh, they always come with a story. Uh, there's no person that's exactly the same. Um, and uh, it can incorporate a social aspect uh, as well as a creative one. Um, I, I, I love photographing landscapes and I love photographing animals and all that kind of thing, but it, it feels quite placed and forced almost because if the sunset is incredible, then you don't need much skill to take that photo. Whereas photographing a person, you need to make them feel comfortable. You need to uh, figure out the best way to light them, the best way to angle them, uh, and then find out who they are and, and, and why you're shooting them and what, what you want the image to say. Um, and also they talk back. I, I, I find it incredibly socially uh, fulfilling. Um, just getting to know millions of people that I would never really come across in any, in any other way of my work, I guess. From the moment that someone arrives at your studio to work with you, how long is it from sort of that initial first meeting to you taking your first shot? How long is the getting to know them period? Um, I would usually say um, minimum 15 minutes, maximum an hour. Um, okay. and it's very difficult to tell. Sometimes people show up and we do just click and end up talking about random stuff for an hour. Um, and I find that fascinating. And then other times people are very eager to get started and they're, they're pretty concise about what they want and what they want me to know. Um, and you kind of gauge it. And sometimes I can just gauge that they, they want to get on with the shooting part and we can talk through that. Um, so it varies from person to person, but I, I would feel weird uh, i would feel weirdly underprepared if i didn't get to chat to them for at least 15 minutes uh, what makes an enjoyable subject to shoot from your perspective someone that is open someone that is listening um i feel it's a little bit like acting uh, because predominantly i photograph actors and uh, actors are always told just to listen to the other person and um that's how you'll get your best uh, performance out and it's similar in photos. I think you can tell if someone's not listening to me or, or connecting or really engaging, then it's much harder to take their photo. Whereas um, predominantly, most of the people I photograph hate having their photo taken. So I'm not expecting them to be, you know, a kind of um, natural Kate Moss or something like that. But as long as they're open to um, direction, they're open to conversation, uh, then that's totally fine. I can do the rest. The more the more um, engaged they are with me, the easier it is to photograph them. I'd say. Um, I've noticed that you photographed some uh, fairly recognisable names. Um, from that perspective, or just from a personality perspective, are you ever intimidated by a subject that you photographed? Um, may, um, maybe, maybe mildly, not intimidated by them, but I would be more nervous that. Uh, the pressure was on, um, and uh, it, there's, there's an expectation of what they're going to be like if they're in the public eye. Um, and sometimes if they're extremely high profile, they are used to having shoots that last 10 minutes, and you, you get 10 minutes with them. Uh, obviously, if they come to shoot with me, you do it in two hours. So it's, um, it's a bit of a more long-form photography. Uh, that they maybe might be used to if they're doing a quick magazine snap or something. Um, I, I'd say generally, I wouldn't call it intimidation. Uh, apprehension maybe, because if they're, for, for example, when I uh, did a session with Natalie Dormer, I'd never actually seen any interviews with her, but she, a lot of the characters she plays are extremely fierce. And I wondered whether that would translate into her personal life, but it absolutely didn't. She was the loveliest most down to earth person ever. So um, I think maybe you just want to make sure you get it right, I suppose. Um, so yeah, but, but, but equally, I, I feel like that with everyone. Um, it's not just people that are well known. Like I want to get a good shot of someone as much as they want me to get a good shot. Of them. Um, and it doesn't matter if they're the most recognizable person off telly or they're just someone that has only just started. 
Speaking in generalities, do you have a, a different approach to photographing men compared to women in terms of your interaction with the subject and also maybe the length of time that you're shooting? Not overly consciously. Uh, it's definitely the same time for both. I, I don't feel I can shoot one gender quicker than another. Um, the approach is generally the same, which is that you just want to make sure they feel as comfortable as possible. And you've got to gauge what that, what that means to them or what, what they require for that. And, and some people need a lot of um, direction and some people just need you to give them some space to, to figure it out themselves. Um, but generally, no, I wouldn't say there's a difference with, uh, in terms of how I interact with them uh, or based on gender. Um, because you can have strong personalities from any walks of life. And uh, I, I, I mean, I have a general set of rules with anybody I photograph to sort of maintain a sort of comfortable boundary. Um, you know, I, I, I don't believe in physically touching someone to move them into a position. I just don't think that's needed. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, I just treat every client exactly the same as the last person. And, and therefore, I hope that they will feel as relaxed as possible. Well, assuming, obviously, I, I know you're only human and people forget kind of the human element when they're dealing in a, any kind of service industry. But when you're uh, working with a, with a subject that you perhaps you're just not clicking, you're not getting on, or maybe you just don't like, um, how do you kind of combat that, the human side of that to still push through and get the photos that you want? Well, I would say actually, I mean, I have no idea how many people I've shot over the years. Maybe, well, I don't know. I have no idea can literally guess. But uh, I've been doing it for 10 years and there's barely been a single person that I would say I didn't like. Um, there's barely been anybody that's behaved badly in the studio or rudely. Um, there, of course, there are some times where you don't click as well and that might be down to all sorts of factors. It could be that they're nervous. It could be that they're tired. It could be that they don't actually really want to talk that much. They just want to get the job done. Um, and in that case, that's totally fine. You just kind of allow them to, to, to be like that. And then, and, and just think of the best way technically you can get the photograph of them without, um, having to keep the conversation going as much. And, and also sometimes I just turn the radio up so it's not awkward silence, uh, <laughs> but that, that happens rarely. <laughs> Um, obviously you, you talked about like landscape, um, with like, if there's a beautiful sunset, you don't need much technical skill to kind of show off the, the, the beauty of what's there. The same argument, I guess, could be applied to photographing good looking people. Um, but I think that one of the biggest differences is that obviously a person is much more interactive than a landscape or an object. What's the secret to creating an expressive portrait? Because so many people are able to create like pretty images of pretty people, but how do you go about creating something expressive? Well, I think that's why I like to have a conversation. I think the moments just before or just after someone has said something is where the magic is. Um, of course, you can shoot extremely good looking people with good lighting and they will look pretty. But you might not get as much um, uh, energy behind the eyes. You might not. It depends what you're trying to say. I remember photographing um, an old man I knew who lived in the Caribbean who since sadly passed away, but was a wonderful man. And I wanted to get his portrait because he was late 90s, I think, and just had the most wonderful face. Um, and I asked if I could take his portrait and he said yes. So I went round to his, his garden and, and he was sat there. And every time I tried to take a photo of him, he did a big, almost kind of cheese smile like, like you would do with a family photograph. And I didn't want that. I wanted just him because uh, uh, he had such a, a sort of uh, noble look about him. Um, and I didn't know how to do it because also you don't want to patronize someone and you don't want to force someone. Uh, and then all it took was there were a couple of kids in the next door garden making a lot of noise. And he just looked over to them and watched them doing whatever they were doing. And it was then that I got the portrait that I wanted. And as soon as I got that, I knew I was happy because he wasn't focused on giving me a big smile. Whatever was going on in his brain then was 10 times more interesting than him smiling for me. Um, so it's through conversation. It's through luck. It's through uh, random moments that maybe you weren't expecting. Um, but yeah, the less forced, the better, I think. 
I've seen cinematographers talk about uh, adapting the focal length that they're shooting with based on the facial structure or the fa- the shape of the person's face that they're filming. Do you, you ever look at the sort of facial structure or the shape of a person's features and does that impact the focal length that you would shoot them with? I wouldn't change my focal length. Uh, I would definitely change the lighting. Um, I One of my good friends who's a photographer, Chris Mann, who does similar work to me, he always says to me, don't think about changing the focal length because you'll just overthink that. And I do think he's right. I mean, I've got a million and one lenses, but I only try and use one because if you're worried about, if you're thinking about the focal length, maybe you're not uh, concentrating on the subject as much. Um, But I certainly do change the lighting uh, if they're in my studio, depending on the structure of their face, um, depending on um, eye color or anything like that. Um, it, it, you can definitely adapt to that. But I've heard about cinema, cinematographers doing that, but part of their job is to know every tiny little detail about what the different focal lengths do. And my knowledge on that isn't that great. So I tend to stick to the two main lenses that I use really um, and try not to worry too much about it. Well, on that subject, I was actually going to ask you what your favorite lenses were for like headshots and portraits. So I guess since we're in the ballpark, we'll go for it. What are your favorite lenses? Okay. Um, Well, if I'm doing headshots, uh, I use a Canon 5D Mark III um, and I use a 70 to 200 millimeter L lens. Um, And the reason I use that is my studio is probably only about um, 20 foot deep. Whereas with the uh, zoom lens, you can really cheat the depth of the room. So it looks like the background is 40, 50 feet away. Um, and it can help to make backgrounds uh, slightly less cluttered and intrusive. Uh, and it's nice and clean. It's very reliable. It's extremely versatile as a lens um, for headshot. Um, so that's my go-to. Um, unfortunately, it weighs a ton. So I have a completely bust shoulder from 10 years of holding that. But it is worth it. It's a really lovely lens. Um, then if I'm doing portrait stuff or editorial stuff, I use a Leica, uh, an ME, uh, and I have a 50 millimeter lens. Uh, I have also got a couple of other lenses for that, but it's a range finder. Um, and it's much less user friendly, but I feel like you get more of a, um, spontaneous feel with the photograph, a bit like with film. Sometimes you'll get the most amazing photograph, but it'll be ever so slightly out of focus. And then you kind of realize, well, Maybe that's not a problem. Maybe that's what that photo was supposed to be. Um, So for portrait work, I'll use that. And also because it's small, it's a very small camera, the Leica. You can take it around the street. It looks like your your bust camera that your granddad gave you. No one's really paying attention. Whereas with the the Canon 5D, it looks literally like a Canon. It's huge. So you you can't really blend in if you're trying to take, um, you know, subtle street photography. Um, So, yeah. Those are the two cameras and lenses I mainly use from day to day. And something I think gets lost in the mix a little bit is when people are looking at new, like potentially picking up a new camera or they're just discussing gear in general, they talk about the specs of a camera, like everything has to be the most up-to-date specs and they focus so much on just reading off of a spec sheet. Whereas I actually think sort of the physical shape, the logistics, the ergonomics of a camera speak as much to how you use it as any spec would ever really matter. I think we've kind of plateaued in the sense of what a camera can do. And it's now just a case of it having the right effect on your environment and the right effect on you when you're shooting. Would I be in the right ballpark for you? Yeah, I 100% agree. Um, prime example is that my the Canon 5D Mark III and the Leica ME are not top of the range. Um, and I used to always think you had to have top of the range camera, but the ME, there's the M10 above that and the Canon 5D Mark IV now. But you're right, the, the, the specs have plateaued really in terms of day-to-day photography. I mean, okay, if you're doing big billboard photography and you don't want to be using a medium format camera, then yeah, maybe the Mark IV might be a bit better. But the day-to-day portraits or photographs that ultimately probably are only viewed on a computer or a phone those cameras are more than enough and it is completely down to personal preference like i photograph completely differently when i have the leica because it's a quarter of the size it's a different feel um it it has a more raw energy with the with the photographs so yeah i mean i could look at upgrading it to the m10 but i i love my camera but it's like you know it's it's like it's little own personality. So I don't want to 
upgrade. As long as it keeps working, I'll keep shooting on that. Um, and for headshots, actors' headshots, the 5D is more than enough. No one really needs to see the, the actors' headshots larger than a computer screen nowadays anyway, um, and that's plenty. So, yeah, I, I 100% agree on that. On the subject of headshots, um, how much have you seen them evolve in terms of the style that's generally accepted in the industry over the 10 years, I think you said that you've been doing it? Has there been much progression or change in the way that sort of the fashion of headshots has come along? Yeah, 100%. I'd say it's probably evolved more in the past 10 years than it has the, the, the entire time that actors have needed headshots, which I don't know when they started printing the photographs, maybe back in the 70s or something. But um, I think the big uh, change came when the internet became fast enough that British actors were sending tapes to America. And then you had to be top of the game. Uh, I went to drama school and studied as an actor. And when I left, if you were wearing a black t-shirt against a white background and it was black and white, that would be fine. Whereas nowadays, that really won't cut it. And uh, in the age of Instagram and, and IMDB, where you can have uh, alternative photographs of yourself that make you look more unique or more interesting or more in the moment or a still from a film, it kind of forces the headshot energy to modernize a little bit and be more eye-catching. Because as a casting director or an agent or a director, if you are looking at 100 photographs of black and white faces with black t-shirts on, you can't see anything. Whereas if you start to feel like you're looking at a person or a, or a tiny bit of a piece of art or something or a unique style, um, then it can stand out. Uh, and that's why I think over the past five years, particularly, um, what is classed as a headshot, the boundaries of that have changed considerably. There was a time where people would go, that's not a headshot, you can't use that. And then people sort of realized, well, who, who says, who makes that, that rule? Um, if it's on spotlight or, or if a director sees it and likes it, then it is a headshot. Um, there are other photographers, don't get me wrong, there are photographers out there that will disagree. But I think if it looks like you on a good day, it's an interesting photograph, the, the, the colors complement you, it's got energy, then of course it's a headshot. Um, and I think the way the industry will develop further is that I believe in another 10 years, an actor's headshot will look much more editorial. It will look more like an, a, a photograph you would expect to see of an actor in an interview in the Evening Standard or something like that, um, and less like a mugshot. Well, you studied as an actor. Does, does that inform you particularly well when it comes to directing your subjects in terms of how to kind of pull emotion, how to sort of manipulate them into getting what you want? Yeah, 100%. Partly because I really like actors. Most of my friends are actors. Uh, also because um, I've been on the other side. I'm ter I am terrible at having my photo taken. One of the worst. Um, so I always approach it from that point of view. Um, in my eyes, if you can make someone feel comfortable, then you can get a decent headshot out of them. And that's always the challenge when someone has to photograph me because I'm so uncomfortable. So I approach it in respect to thinking, well, if that was me sat there, what's the best approach um, to, to, to get it out of them? You know, For example, I, I think one of the golden rules with taking someone's photograph is you never tell them they're doing anything wrong because then they're instantly going to be insecure about their choices um so whatever they're doing you just uh try and positively steer them towards uh more what you think they should be doing um and just treat everybody in the same way that, that having your photo taken is a, it's a weird experience you meet some random person who takes hundreds of photographs of you that you, you you've never met this person and, and you've got to try and look comfortable so uh you try and facilitate that as best as possible i think I think we're 100% on the same page. I actually got myself in trouble a while back with a really terrible wording of this, which was I said that the worst thing you can do on a photo shoot is say no. And I meant from the photographer's perspective, like um, like you said, if you have a subject that tries something and it's not working, you need to sort of shoot through that and steer it away and sort of count those frames as just part of the journey towards the ones you wanted, as opposed to kind of just saying, no, this isn't what I wanted and you know, kill that confidence, kill that belief that they had in what they were doing. Um, so I completely agree with you there, 100% on the same page. One thing I did want to know, and I sort of tend to make the mistake of always starting uh, these podcasts with this, but I actually kind of feel like now's the right time to fit it in. Is photography something that's in your family or is it something you discovered on your own and what brought you to it? 
Um, no, it's not in my family. I, I mean, my dad took photos of us as a family on an old Minolta film camera. Um, and I just remember being really interested in it. And, and when I was younger, I, I used to go and take, I was, I was obsessed with the idea of being a wildlife photographer. So I'd go out of the garden and take 24 blurry frames of the cat or a frog in the pond and they were all rubbish, but I just loved it. You know, for my birthday, I would get a camera and I'd be taken to the zoo and they would all just be blurry animals through a fence. But I loved it and I've still got some of those dreadful photos. So it's not in the family, but my parents definitely encouraged it as a creative strain. Um, it probably also was slightly financially draining because back then films were the done thing and they cost money to develop. So um, it was very generous of them to <laughs> help me keep that uh, that um, hobby alive. And then I kind of sort of just had it bubbling away and then decided at A-level to take it. Um, and I really enjoyed it, but it, it mainly just taught you about the sort of ins and outs of practical photography in the darkroom, you know, film developing, printing and that kind of thing. And that was fascinating, but particularly in, in the way the world was about to change into photography wise in the digital era, it was kind of redundant. Um, and then about four years later, I just about managed to scrape enough money together to buy a very, very basic SLR, digital SLR. And, and that's where it really exploded for me because then it didn't cost money to take photos. And that was the main thing. You know, I could go out and take 200 photos and that wouldn't cost a penny because I could delete them all. Um, and I think when I was a kid with film particularly, because digital wasn't around then, there was a bit of a, you know, each each photo costs three pounds or something. Um, so I was just very fortunate that my parents were wonderfully supportive with it and and, you know, bought me the camera that uh, could help me play around with it when I was younger and <laughs> take me to the zoo. Uh, so that's basically how I got into it. I mean, something I've noticed over the last maybe five years for sure, I have very limited experience with this, but something that I've noticed through the likes of F-stoppers and online um, sort of photographic based blog sites, YouTube and so on, is that the popularity of being a headshot photographer seems to be um, surging probably more than it has at least for some time, if not ever, uh, people like Peter Hurley, obviously being uh, sort of at the front of that movement. Are you finding it's becoming more of a competitive market the last couple of years, or is that just people that are recreationally interested in it and never kind of carrying it forwards? Um, I haven't found. I think I was fortunate enough to start it just before that big, big um, explosion. Um, I think if I was trying to start a headshot business now it would be a lot harder than when I started it in 2009 because there just wasn't that many around in 2009. There was only five or six main photographers in London. And now, and, and also back then, to get a digital SLR, it was a significant amount of money. Whereas now, you can get a perfectly good one for £200 off eBay and then start trying to make money. So I do think more people decide to go into it. I know a few people that I've tried to help get into it. But ultimately, you have to love it and you have to love the idea of trying to get better. It's not, it's not like a bar job where you can just show up and do it. You've got to, it's a hard graft. And I think some people come into it thinking, well, how hard could it be? You put someone by a brick wall under a tunnel, take their photo and charge them 150 quid. But actually it's all the other elements that go into it. And also to be able to look at your work constructively and go, well, that's a crap photo. Why, why, and what can I do to make it better the next time I take it? So yeah, I think it's very saturated now, but I do think a lot of people that start it give up a year later because it's hard work. Um, and unless you want to really try and get, get your, your work up to scratch, then it is probably too saturated. Uh, what's your retouching process? Is it something you're doing yourself or do you outsource it? Uh, I outsource it to a wonderful guy um, who uh, is my only retoucher. I did used to retouch my work because I'm quite obsessive and that kind of thing. But I just found I had no life because I was doing a couple of shoots a day and then coming home and um, retouching until one in the morning. And so it just it didn't make any sense. Because um, I'm a photographer, I'm not a retoucher. I, I can do retouching and I can do it uh, adequately well. But that's not why I became a photographer. And I sort of realized I was wasting half of my time on a part of the industry that wasn't what I got into it for. 
So yeah, I outsource it to a guy who I work very closely with. He knows exactly the kind of retouching that I like and the kind of retouching that I don't. Um, and we have quite a close working relationship on that. Um, so, and it took a while to get there because um, we had to tr- try and figure each other out and, and how to best work together. But now I can send him a batch of photos and he can send them back and I know that he will retouch them in the way that I want. I kind of feel that if you can see retouching, then it's too much. Yes, especially with headshots. 100%. It's got to look natural. It's got to look like them on a good day. If it looks overly airbrushed or the skin doesn't look real uh, or something, the, the human brain is very, 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 very good at spotting something that isn't right. Um, you know, if you watch a terrible CGI film, your brain checks out and goes, nah, I'm not buying this. And it's the same with the photograph. If the retouching is too much, you go, that's not a real person. And you don't connect with it as much. So retouching is a very, very, very um, fine art, which is why retouchers are great at what they do because they keep it subtle, but they uh, really do make a difference to the overall image. In the time that you've been photographing people and just photographing in general, what's the sort of worst habit you've had to work yourself out of that you've developed over time? My worst habit, very good question. Um, My worst habit in taking people's photographs would probably be sometimes I can, because I love the, 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 the story aspect of it. I love hearing about these stories that people come into. Sometimes someone can walk in and tell me one of the most incredible stories I've ever heard. And I just don't know that's walking in. And my, I've got a bad habit of, of, of maybe letting them, I become an audience member rather than a photographer. And the photographer should step in and say, all right, okay, let's take some photographs. We've been talking for an hour. <laughs> Um, whereas mm. I thrive off that aspect of it so much that I can be a bit lax with that. Um, yeah, probably that I would say. A couple of things I learned from your website was, um, you're more than happy to have dogs uh, around, which is pretty good considering right now I've got a one year old chihuahua that's actually snoring about eight foot from where we're recording this. So I'm hoping that's not showing up in the background. <laughs> um, but you also have, a, a, I believe a love for Brendan Gleeson. Yes. I, I feel like you should just elaborate on that. I just, I don't know. I think that's, that's maybe just from my acting background. I just think he's wonderful. I think he's like, he's probably my number one. If I could photograph anybody in the world, um, he has such a heartbreakingly honest, uh, way of showing emotion without doing anything. Um, and any film I ever see him in is so emotionally intelligent that it just buckles me. And I think he's just got a wonderfully stoic face um, and comes from an era of men where they didn't show their emotions. And uh, I, I just find him uh, hypnotic to watch and I can't stop watching. Any, any film he's in, I just think he's marvellous and he's such an intelligent actor and he's such a subtle actor. Um, he would just be an absolute dream to take a portrait of. I, could, I, could, I reckon I could take his portrait in three minutes uh, and I, would, mm-hmm. I could do it in a couple of shots. Um, I, I think he's magic. <laughs> would the three minutes include the time that you wanted to talk to him or would that come, would the three minutes come at the end of like a three hour conversation? I think I would be too intimidated to talk to him. I'm sure he's a lovely oh. man, um, but I would probably set the shot up. Um, I would probably, I, I'd probably be starstruck, I guess. Um, uh, and I would be so focused on wanting to get a photograph of him. It depends what he's like. You know, people like that, sometimes they don't want to talk. They, they, if you photograph them to something, you have got five minutes with them. And then other times, they're more interested in talking to you than having their photo taken. So it depends what he was like in the room, I guess. Um, I've heard he's a very nice bloke, um, so I'm sure he'd be accommodating, but I wouldn't want to take up too much of his time by telling him I think he's brilliant. <laughs> well, obviously, because you work with actors, you studied it yourself. Um, do you ever find yourself getting inspired by like movies and if so what are the ones that have really inspired you in a photographic sense well i guess from that point of view it's it's more about the dop work from a sort of if i'm not looking at adding it if i'm not looking at it from uh, an acting sense then it's definitely the dop work um i never remember people's names which is terrible but I, the best that um they did recently uh oh. with marion cotillard and um uh, oh God, what kind of uh, fast bender? Um, I, I saw that in the cinema and it just blew me away. It felt like 
every single shot I would frame on my wall and have as a photograph. It was shot so beautifully that it was almost distracting. I couldn't really focus on what was going on because it, every single frame, I mean, it helped that it was shot in Scotland and Scotland is one of the most naturally beautiful places I've ever been. So, um, yeah, something like that. I like a lot of the Coen brothers films, the way they frame everything up. Um, and also, I mean, it, it's an obvious one, but Christopher Nolan, um, he, he just knows how to make a picture. Uh, it's, uh, it, the, the, um, DOP that he always uses is just extraordinary. I can't remember his name. I'm terrible with names. Um, but yeah. On the subject of the Cohen brothers, they, um, there's a brilliant uh, video about them by Every Frame a Painting on YouTube and shows an interview with um, one of them. I'm, I'm like you, I can't remember names for the life of me. And if I could, I'd always get the wrong one. But one of them, they're, they're, they're interviewing him and he actually stops the interview and says, um, you see, this is how I wouldn't do it because you've got this long lens viewing me over your shoulder. So now the viewer feels like an outsider. They don't feel connected to what you're doing. And he makes them change the lens over to something wider brings the camera in he's like see now you feel like you're part of the conversation don't you and i just thought it was so funny that he was like directing his own interview wow that sounds very cool i have to check it out on youtube or wherever it is yeah i'll send it over to you um looking back over your career um as it's gone by and obviously right now is a bit of an uncertain time but a good time for all of us to kind of reflect on what we've done and what we've done right and what we've done wrong if you could go back to your to sort of talk to yourself at the start of your journey, what would you tell yourself to avoid or recommend doing? Or are you just kind of really happy with the path that you've gone down? Um, I would probably uh, advise my uh, older self or younger self, whichever way around it is. Uh, I'd probably say get a studio quicker um, because once you have your own space that is yours, that you can do anything with in terms of like the background, the lighting, you can tweak it. You're not worried about a dog walker coming through or you're not worried about, um, you know, being interrupted. Then you can really create an experiment. And uh, I think like most headshot photographers do, I started by shooting outside or shooting in doorways or on the bridges and stuff like that. And you have to take so much other stuff into account, like the British weather, which is a nightmare, or, or bystanders or that kind of thing that uh, it, it, it can hamper a, a, a little bit of the creativity. So I'd probably go back and because I waited, I think I got a studio in 2014 and I started in 2009 and I would just say, get one earlier. And it doesn't have to be an expensive one or because my studio is just a, a room with three big windows in it. Um, and that's enough for me to play around with basically. Um, and also not to be afraid to get things wrong. Um, uh, I got so much stuff wrong when I started, but that's how you get better as a, as with any sort of creative um, endeavor, I, I assume. But uh, yeah, don't be afraid of getting things wrong. Get your own space quicker. That would be my advice. And if we were to put Brendan Gleeson to one side, is there anyone out there that you'd really love to photograph um, that you haven't had the chance to yet? Yeah, there's loads. I mean, uh, sharing the top spot with Brendan Gleeson for me would be Barack Obama. Um, I don't think you can take a bad photograph of him. I don't think, uh, I, I think I, I, I just think he's such a interesting, incredible, uh, intelligent human being. Um, yeah. Uh, I would love to shoot him. Although the chance of that is pretty slim. That's like saying you want to be an actor and you want to play James Bond. Um, it's a pretty small club. I don't want to play James yeah. Bond by the way, but you know, um, yeah, Barack Obama would be up there. Um, the Queen, maybe. I think that that would just be extremely interesting as a as an experience. Um, I don't have much of an opinion on her, but I would love to know what that is like to photograph her. And something um, because we're in that in that sort of area with the Queen and Barack Obama, you know, politics. Like you just said, you don't have much of an opinion. What do you make of the sort of current? phase that we're going through where everyone feels i say everyone obviously not meaning everyone but there's a general sense um that there needs to be some kind of social or political message attached to art and that you can't ever just create something to stand on its own it always has to be kind of furthering one idea or another do you think that's potentially damaging to art overall or do you think that's a positive thing mm, i think it could be damaging if it stops people making art for just themselves um I don't, I, li I like to take photographs for myself. Um, and I think if you focus too much on either a message in it or, or what other people will think on the images that you're putting out there, then that can be quite a destructive path to go down. 
Um, I think, I, I do think creative art with a message is incredibly powerful and I'm not doing that down at all. But I do also think that whatever art you're making is primarily for you. So it doesn't matter if no one else ever sees it. Uh, if it, if it, if it makes you feel good and it makes you uh, engage with it, that's, that's the main thing. Um, and if you worry too much about what other people are taking from it or the message they might be trying to read into it, then I would, I would say that's probably not an ideal headspace to be in personally. I've really appreciated the time that you've um, given us here and the insight into what you do. And um, what I'd love to do is to make sure that everyone that comes on here knows how they can find your work. It's been quite ironic the last couple of weeks, considering um, I've been doing these remotely and I've spoken to people that are so much more infinitely talented and higher up the ladder. Um, It's kind of funny for me to be recommending people of such high skill and uh, following. But thank you. Where can everyone find your work um, and your social media links and whatnot? Um, Well, I mainly post on Instagram. Uh, which is Michael Shelford, I think. And then I have a website which has uh, my main portfolio of um, headshots and portraits, which is shelfordheadshots.com. It's been amazing to talk to you. Thank you so much for taking the time. I really do appreciate it. No problem. My pleasure. Thanks. Thanks.